Aside from some political intrigue at court, the era of the Julio-Claudian emperors, which stretches from Octavian's victory at Actium in 31 BCE and ends with Nero's suicide in 68 CE, was a time of remarkable peace, prosperity, and stability. However, after Nero died, the Roman world would be thrown into a series of civil wars which would see four emperors rise and fall between 68 and 69, Nero being the first of those to fall. But what was it that served as a catalyst for this great event? Now obviously, as we'll discuss, any such event or political turmoil has deeper and more complicated causes. But there is actually one person who is the catalyst for the beginning of this period. And that person is none other than Gaius Julius Vindex. So in this video, I want to take a look at his life and how he contributed to what later became known as the Year of the Four Emperors. And I will argue that while he clearly did enter into a revolt in a way that was intentional, the unintentional consequence of his revolt was that he brought about chaos and showed other governors that rebellion against established dynasties was very possible and could be rewarded with success. Gaius Julius Vindex was born around the year 25 CE. He was a Roman citizen and he was also a senator, but his heritage was Gallic and he would always retain strong connections in the province of Gaul. His name indicates that his family had earned its Roman citizenship under Augustus. Most likely this was part of a larger block grant where Augustus empowered many of the local aristocrats in this area of southwestern Gaul, where most of the more reliable Gallic tribes resided. So Vindex was born into the Gallic aristocracy and he was able to then use his Roman citizenship and wealth to work his way into the Senate. In the year 54 CE, the elderly Emperor Claudius died and he was replaced by his adoptive son Nero. Nero was only 16 at the time and he was guilty of more than a few youthful indiscretions. However, Nero's government was more or less run by his closest counselors like Burrus and Seneca, and for the most part, Nero's reign was a time of good government, right up until the time when Nero took the reins of government himself. And by 67 or 68, Nero's insistence on governing in his own right, but also not paying the closest of attention to government affairs, had alienated many members of the elite. That combined with acts of disrespect toward the elite, such as forcing them to attend his singing performances, had alienated many members of the elite. And it's pretty clear that among the people who were really furious about Nero's conduct was Gaius Julius Vindex. However, despite the fact that Nero was not at all popular among the elite on any level, he was actually very popular among the commoners. Um, and he also enjoyed solid support among the legions. Not all that many soldiers were willing to raise the banner of revolt against the emperor. In their minds, he had done a good enough job. By 68, Nero was 30 years old, and there were no real signs that he would ever mature or change in a way that would make him a worthy heir to Augustus. Nero's lack of interest in commanding armies also meant that he was potentially vulnerable to any military commander who attained glory or renown. After all, soldiers like to follow victorious generals, and Nero would never be that. And since Nero, at age 30, was likely to go on living for quite a long while, many of these soldiers would never get to achieve glory since Nero would have to prevent any of his generals from going out and achieving much, otherwise they would pose a threat to his power. So, um, this is a dangerous situation potentially, and all it would take is for one general to gain a great deal of success, and then Nero's time on the throne would most likely be endangered. So it was really a powder keg by the time we get to 68. Anything could have shaken Nero's hold on power, but all he had to do to prevent it was to become more active in politics, to take field commands, to be more attentive to his public duties, 
to show more respect to the people he relied upon to hold offices and perform public duties. But of course, Nero was Nero, and he did none of those things. Let's trace the course of Vindex's career up until the year 68 to get a sense of where he stood in the Roman world among the elite. So if he had been born in the year 25 or so, then Vindex would have been about 43 years old in 68, which for the Romans, being in your 40s was pretty much the ideal age. I meant that you were still youthful enough to engage in physical activities while having enough experience to temper youthful impulses. He seems to have been a new man, so his entry into the Senate was probably a little bit later than more established senators, but most likely he would have been a keister and therefore a senator by about the age of 30. By comparison, someone from a much more established senatorial family might hold the keistership in their early to mid-twenties and therefore get on the fast track and even be consul at around the age of 42 or so. But at any rate, if you're a new man, you have to be content with a slightly slower cycle of development. He held the office of Praetor in around 66. This is my guess, just based on the fact that he was a pro-Praetorian governor in 67 and 68. And he was probably eligible for the consulship by 70 or so. So had he fulfilled his term in office as a pro-Praetorian governor and then gone back to Rome, he possibly could have caught the emperor's eye and been selected as a consul. However, for whatever reason, he chooses not to do that, and we'll discuss his probable reasons why as we go along. However, we do know that by the year 67, Gaius Julius Vindex was the pro-Praetorian governor responsible for his home territory of Gallia Aquitania, which was a large inland province in Gaul. Gallia Aquitania was a senatorial rather than an imperial province which means, significantly, that this was a province that the emperors didn't bother controlling in terms of appointing governors and making sure that these people were loyal. In fact, there were plenty of senatorial governors who were outspoken critics of emperors and would still get elected. This was almost like a built-in safety valve, so emperors would allow some senators who opposed them to have a successful career but they would not give them imperial provinces where they would have an army. That meant that all the imperial provinces were under people who had been appointed by the emperor. So the idea is that even if Vindex had been, say, an outspoken critic of Nero before all of this broke out, he was in a place where he wasn't actually going to be able to do any damage because he was in a province with no troops. Anyway, so this is about where Vindex was at this time, and it also maybe wouldn't be all that likely that he would become consul if he were a known critic of Nero. But because of the limitations of our knowledge, we actually don't know if he had had any beef with Nero prior to the year 68. During the early and high empire, the Romans had a division between senatorial and imperial provinces. You could also just think of it as a difference between civilian and military provinces. And Vindex's province, Gallia Aquitania, was a civilian province because he had no legions stationed there. None were deemed necessary. There were no active wars, there was no frontier with a hostile power, and there were no active revolts at the time. This province, Gallia Aquitania, was large and fairly wealthy. A governor there would just do the tour of the circuits around the cities of the province, uh, dispense justice, um, hear cases, it would probably be a fairly cush assignment, especially if you were a native of the province and you had the kind of connections that Vindex had. He might have had a very small military force with him, either recruited by himself or given to him by Rome, and this force would just be for his own protection and also for assistance in tax collecting if something were to go askew. But for the most part, he did not have what we would think of as anything like an army. However, because he is a native of Gallia Aquitania and he has excellent local connections, he would be able to potentially raise locals and form an army. That being said, in an era where you have actual professional legions, these local levies would have gotten their asses handed to them pretty quickly by a legion. 
So his military resources are actually clearly inferior to any imperial governor, and there actually were some wealthier provinces in the Roman world that might have served as better bases of revolt than Gallia Aquitania, although Gallia Aquitania was a fine choice if you had to make such a revolt. If you were to read a bare-bones account of the events of 68 and 69, I think that it would be easy to assume that Vindex simply wanted to become emperor. However, the facts kind of seem to militate against that, because Vindex was not qualified by the standards of the day to be emperor. Now later on, you don't have to have any specific ethnicity or any specific set of honors to become emperor. However, in this early imperial period, no one outside of the Julio-Claudian family had held the office. So the idea was that even if you could go beyond that family, you needed to go to a patrician or at least a very well-heeled family. So, um, if we look at some of the conspiracies under previous Julio-Claudian emperors, they always revolved around people of very noble bloodlines. Vindex certainly was not that by the standards of the Roman world. He also lacked consular rank. Now, the consulship had become a bit ceremonial, and it was a pre-selected office that emperors controlled. However, it was still seen as the premier honor, and you would build up your seniority by holding multiple consulships. So if you wanted to build up the authority and the reputation of someone within the ruling family, you would have them start holding consulships as a teenager. So that way they would technically outrank someone who was an actual lifelong middle-aged senator. Anyway, Vendex clearly didn't have one of those. And the other thing that he really needed to make a serious run at something like this to defeat the Praetorian Guard and seize Rome would be an army. And as someone who was not an imperial governor, he didn't have one of those either. So unless Vendex was deeply delusional or crazy, I just don't think there's a good case to be made that he was aiming at becoming emperor. Most likely, his motives were twofold. One, I think the most compelling reason would be that he was a product of his time and place, and he shared all of the same values and biases of the people around him in the upper class. He also was disdainful of Nero, and he felt like the Roman world deserved a better, i.e. more dignified ruler, someone more in line with the general expectations that aristocrats have, of how aristocrats should behave. The second factor, which is a little more cynical, but I think had to play into his thinking to some extent, is that if he were to successfully spark a revolt and help to install a new ruler or dynasty, the name Vindex would become a household name. Not only that, but the new ruler would be indebted to Vindex and would make sure that he and his descendants had a very good political life. Maybe at some point, one of Vindex's kids or grandkids might even marry in to the ruling house. Who knows? Crazy things could happen. Now that we've established some of Vindex's possible motives for rebelling, let's take a look at the actual events of his revolt. So, Vindex's revolt began in either the last days of 67 or the early part of 68. And this rebellion took the form of Vindex writing a lot of letters to other governors and prominent Romans and asking them to join him in overthrowing Nero. Many of these letters were then taken to Nero by people who wanted to save themselves. Obviously, if you look at the kind of resources that Vindex has, you know that he cannot by himself overthrow Nero. And you might as well just go to Nero and uh, try to get on his good side distance yourself from this revolt. However, there were plenty of people in the provinces who had armies who might be useful allies, so he wrote to them too. And one person that Vindex really tried to ingratiate himself with was Servius Sulpicius Galba, his neighbor in Spain who had a legion and was an old man with a big name. Now, the thing about Galba is that Galba was very ambitious and also very old. And I get the impression that Galba and Vindex very much used each other during this period. For Vindex, it looks like what he was trying to do was to find an elderly person that could become his patron. 
So Galba would have to rely heavily on assistance from other officials since he was already an old man in his 70s. And who better to be his right-hand man than the guy who had raised a banner of revolt against the evil Nero, Gaius Julius Vindex. Maybe Vindex would not have been able to get appointed to be Caesar under Galba, but he would probably do pretty well for himself. And again, he could really work with this new dynasty, and his family would be set up in Rome. On the other hand, Galba clearly took advantage of Vindex's revolt itself. He never actually responded to Vindex, but what he did do is start to secretly build up his forces under the pretense that he was going to have to go to Gallia Aquitania to put down the revolt of Vindex. Apparently, Galba also was of the thought that Nero, just because of the fact that Galba had been contacted by Vindex, that Nero would be paranoid and would be coming after him eventually. So, in many ways, Vindex's letter did make Galba revolt, although it's not clear whether he just wanted to seize power or whether he thought that he had to seize power to avoid being um, executed or stripped of his office by Nero. At any rate, though, before any kind of alliance could have materialized between Vindex and Galba, assuming that one was going to materialize at some point, uh, Vindex's revolt was destroyed by the governor of Germania Superior, Lucius Virginius Rufus. And Rufus had more than a few legions. He had a pretty substantial army under him on the Rhine frontier. Virginius took his forces into Gallia Aquitania, and Vindex took his hastily acquired force, and they met at the Battle of Vesantio. From all appearances, though, Vesantio was not supposed to be a battle, and it looks like the two governors were going to meet and come to some kind of an agreement. However, Virginius's men decided to attack Vindex, and they wiped out his force, and this also led to his death in battle. There's been some speculation as to what was going on or what Virginius was trying to accomplish. Many people, including Tacitus, seem to think that basically Virginius was a weak leader and his troops wanted to gain some plunder. They were bored and they had been fighting on the frontier for a long time, which was never very profitable, but now they had an excuse to defeat an enemy army and then plunder Roman land where there was lots of wealth. But anyway, the details of what happened afterwards and what drove the soldiers are not quite as important as the basic fact that Vindex actually might have been close to finding a major ally, someone who could help him like Virginius Rufus, but bad luck and bad command and control ultimately led to his death. So that was all that she wrote for Vindex's revolt although obviously the repercussions would live on well beyond it, the author of this revolt. By the end of 68, Nero was dead, and Galba was almost universally accepted as emperor. When he gave a public address dealing with why Nero had been overthrown, he said that the fault lay not with himself nor with Julius Vindex, but with Nero himself. However, I would argue that despite the fact that Nero most likely was the cause of his own demise, the catalyst was Julius Vindex. And not only did he start Galba's revolt in a way, but he also set in motion the entire train of events that we now call the Year of the Four Emperors. Vindex's revolt, first of all, gave Galba a pretext for raising additional forces and going on to seize power altogether. It also started to build up the stress that ultimately led Nero to commit suicide, although, to be fair, Galba had a bigger role to play when it came to really freaking Nero out. When he finally got to Rome, Galba did mint a coin to honor Vindex, and he even said that he owed quite a bit to Vindex and his decision to revolt. The main lesson of Julius Vindex, however, is perhaps not one that he knew, but one that he managed to teach nonetheless, and that is what Tacitus and the histories had to say about the secret of empire. The secret of empire, of course, is that emperors can be made in places other than Rome, namely among the legions. If you have legions behind you and they believe in you, you too can be emperor. 
And that's not something that the Romans would have learned in 68 or 69 if not for the perhaps misguided idealism of one Gaius Julius Vindex.